My dad went to work and never came home. If there's a reason that this plane crashed and my relatives are dead, maybe we should know a bit more. 61 people fell out of the sky and nobody seems to care. There's a lot of theories and, you know, urban legends going around as to what happened. Each of those 61 souls was a parent, a brother, a sister, a wife, a mother. They belonged to somebody. On the morning of March 24th, 1968, Aer Lingus Flight 712 left Cork for London Heathrow. 40 minutes later, it crashed into the sea off the Wexford coast near Tusker Rock Lighthouse. 61 passengers and crew were on board. There were no survivors. The search for victims resumed this morning after eight hours yesterday failed to locate wreckage. British Air Force Gannets and Shackletons took off from Brody Naval Air Force Base before dawn to join the naval ships and lifeboats that had searched through the night. A Shackleton pilot spotted the first body about midday, just off the Tusker Rock, and about 20 miles north of where it had been thought the plane crashed. We were flying at 100 feet over the Tusker Rock when the first body was picked up at 1.26 this afternoon. Immediately afterwards, a number of other bodies were reported floating in the sea by a pilot close by. The mystery remains why the plane crashed in the first place. At a moment when Ireland was broadening its horizons and air travel was starting to become more affordable, this remains the country's worst aviation disaster. Almost 55 years later, theories still persist as to what happened that day. Questions remain unanswered, but for the families of those who lost their lives, the memories of their loved ones remain strong. I remember that dress. Do you? That's very good. This one was the one that she sent in with her CV to Aer Lingus to right. apply. Professional. For the job. Yeah. Air hostesses, as they were called. And she loved it. The excitement and the, uh, yeah, the high life. <laughs> and this one here, then, was the official one from Aer Lingus. Yeah. Very nice one. Mm, beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I remember. She came home one evening and she said, Oh, we did a, the big escape today. And she described letting out the chute and they all had to slide down. And when they were all on the ground, whoever was the instructor said, Well, you were all dead about 10 minutes ago. That was how bad they were at the exercise. <laughs> I just remember that little bit. This was to be her last flight, and uh, she was going to give me a hand to get my wedding organised. That was to be her last flight, yeah. I was number one, and number 12 was just under a year old, my little brother John, uh, when Daddy died. And he worked in the oil refinery in Whitegate, in, in Cork, and he was uh, one of a management team down there. He was on the technical side, and that's why he was going to London. It still brings tears to my eyes, seeing Daddy in that video, to see him laughing and talking with his friends and moving and running a race and telling jokes. And I suddenly remembered him alive, doing things like that. And, well, he, he, it was just so amazing to remember him as a moving, living person. He was absolutely full of life. He was an extraordinary man. He did so many things. I mean, he built us a tennis court. He built us a football pitch. He built us a swimming pool. He built boats and we would go out sailing in, in, in Cork Harbour. I mean, life was just full to the brim. And he was absolutely there all the time until one day he wasn't. Paul was four years younger than me, 
but we, we shared a bedroom all the time I lived at home. He loved just the adventure of it, going up in the air, and he was my best man, and we were living in London at the time of the crash, and he came over the week before, which was Patrick's Day, when our first son was baptised, and he was godfather. Uh, we were delighted to see him, and last thing in our mind was that we would never see him again. My father decided to go to uh, Ireland to fish the salmon. From Killerney, and, and he writes, Meilleur baiser, Marcel. Huh? So, Meilleur baiser, Marcel. I have image, yes, when he was coming at school, uh, because at that time, my father uh, was a, a lover of America. He bought an, an, a car, an Oldsmobile, and I remember when he came uh, at school, uh, I was so excited. Uh, when, but sometimes I say, okay, is it really a, a memory of it is because my mother always told him, your father did that, your father did that with you. Uh, so, so I'm not sure if it is real. Sunday, March 24th, was Mother's Day. Going to the airport was still a rare enough occurrence to be memorable and important enough to deserve dressing up in Sunday's best. I remember very, very well. He was dressed in his suit, in his, what I called his business suit, which was just black. And, uh, oh, I find this emotional, but he... He was going away, and I said, oh, you're going away for the week? Oh, oh, bye. And he walked away from me and he said, see you, Pete Oaks, which was lovely. He used to call me Pete Oaks, or it was Peter, if I was in trouble. So, <laughs> and that was it, he was gone then. That was it, and I just see him standing there in his suit, and but some of my siblings went to the airport with him that day. It was a big thing, and you watched all the planes landing, and you, you could go to the front window and wave at them as they got on. And my siblings and my mother knew what seat he was sitting on. They thought, they thought when they came home, you know. The interesting thing is, Daddy was always interested in air crashes. He talked a great deal about one in 1953, and he always talked about it. And he said, but do you know, Aer Lingus is the safest airline in the world. We have a really good track record. He used to say that. Like it was a big event to go to the airport in 1968 and see somebody off. So the flight was due to go sometime, I believe, around 11. So we all went up around nine. And I hung around just, you know, talking and whatever. And then I just remember the photograph being taken outside of all of us. My mum took the photograph. My aunt, my mother's youngest sister, and her two daughters, um, Paula and Marion, who were aged two and 16 at the time. Um, so they'd been here for a week and were returning to England that Sunday morning. It was exciting. Like, Marion was going off on an adventure and you kind of took it for granted that this was going to be a kind of normal event, like somebody getting a bus on one level. But it was exciting because you were going to be seeing them taking off up into the air as well. The plane, a Vickers Viscount, was just over 10 years old. Aer Lingus had plans to retire its propeller fleet and replace them with modern jet aircraft. But in 1968, the Viscount was still in constant use. New records in recent days by British airliners highlight the great achievements of our aircraft industry in capturing world market and outstanding among the market winners is the Vickers Viscount. And it is widely acclaimed as the finest short and medium haul airliner in service today. Over a million flying hours in all conditions have proved the Viscount a world beater. The number of Viscount aircraft built was 445, of which 150 or so were involved in accidents. Many of them weren't explained. Some of the accidents are unexplained. 
The airplane was reliable for its time, if you know what I mean. It wasn't a dangerous airplane, but 150 is a lot to crash. But a lot of the ones that crashes would have been very old ones, and they would have been used uh, in, in developing areas where the maintenance and, all, and the quality of the flight crew and all that wouldn't be great, you know? Fintan Ryan had trained with his good friend, First Officer Paul Heffernan, and had flown regularly on the doomed plane. But this is my logbook, and the aircraft, the same film, which was uh, Os Oscar Mike. And I flew that on the 9th of this February, 1968, which is, is the, uh, if you like, the month before the accident. And if I go further on then, I find that on the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, on uh, the 16th, I flew with Barney O'Byrne. Uh, I did flights to Liverpool, Birmingham uh, and London and return with, with uh, Barney O'Byrne, who was the captain at the time. So that's uh, eight flights just uh, in, in the month of the accident. So uh, I got to know Barney f from flying with him from quite a bit, just immediately before the accident, which unfortunately himself and Paul died. The propeller started and it went out and gently glided up into the air and was gone and we thought no more about it, to be honest with you, once we saw it disappear into the clouds. Well, I wasn't at the airport. No, I didn't go to the airport, but uh, I was up in training with the lads up at the, um, at the athletics field that day and I saw a plane going over. I said, that's the plane that Neil's on. He was going uh, to get a flight from London Airport to Switzerland to do a, a, an interview in Switzerland. I think it was half past one, it was on Radio Air. And um, at the end of the, the broadcast, it said, uh, the speaker said, uh, we've just heard a message that, uh, from Aer Lingus that the flight 712 is delayed going to London. So kind of, my mother was there sitting at the table, I was there. And we were just, you know, ah, oh, yeah, it didn't really make any difference. You see, you didn't think that it was going to be any, make any difference, you know? My Auntie Mary, who lived close by in London, knocked on the door to say she'd got the news that Paul's plane was missing on the Sunday. Um, it was missing. I think it was around lunchtime that it went down, but this was in the mid-afternoon. Mid so we went to Mass for a second time on a Sunday in London. They sent one um, air hostess called, also called Anne Kelly, and a young pilot with the two that were sent to our hall door to inform us that yeah. the flight was busy. The other Anne Kelly, that was the poor unfortunate girl who was trotted out to meet us. Imagine that, that's by that. And then the, so we, and the wait then after that, the, the, um, yeah, that was, that was very harrowing after that. In Belgium, wives and families had gathered at the airport to meet the six men returning from their Irish fishing trip. I was there too. Huh? I was there too with my mother. They were all the women waiting there for their husband. Huh? The six women, they, they, they went to a room and, and then the man said, il y a eu un petit pépin. I don't, I don't know how we can translate that in, uh, in English. Uh, il y a eu un petit pépin, un petit pépin. A small worry. Yeah, a small worry, yeah, something like that. A small worry. The plane has disappeared, but say un petit pépin. I heard the phone ringing and I heard my mother saying, no, no, oh, that's all I could hear. And I grabbed my dress and kind of ran out. And she was sitting on the stool by the phone and she, she was trying to talk. She said, Daddy's plane is missing. And My 
uncle came to meet me and he put his hands out like this. And he said, Claire, there is no hope. And I looked at him. And I screamed. That can be very rough there with the very strong tides. And the tide going against the wind can make the sea very rough. Deep water as well. Having left Cork at 11.32 a.m., Aer Lingus Flight 712 was declared missing less than an hour later. It was Sunday afternoon, and we heard the Maroons going off at lifeboat. And we came down and uh, the lifeboat was on the slip by ready to be launched. We went off, we saw nothing, it got dark. And when we came back here that night, we got word to be down in the morning at seven o'clock. And we got word to render us at the Tusker. There had been some bodies found before we got there. I remember being up and saying, watch for the seagulls. They'd be hovering over the body. And we, we picked up two bodies. A little bit of wreckage, that's... That was Monday afternoon. There were 11 bodies picked up that, that Monday. It was a Vickers Viscount like this one which set off from Cork that Sunday morning. The Viscount left Cork for London just after 11.30 and headed east. By 11.57, it was at its cruising altitude of 17,000 feet. It reported its position normally to Cork Air Traffic Control and was told to change frequency to London ATC. In the next few seconds, a disaster of some kind struck the aircraft. Almost immediately, it identified itself to London ATC, followed by the message, 12,000 feet descending, spinning rapidly. Nothing more was ever heard from the Viscount. Father of 12, Desi Walls, was one of the missing. His brother Arthur was acting head of Aer Lingus that day, and he had to break the news to the family. Arthur was the brother that came after my father. He was my godfather. We were very proud of his position, Aer Lingus. He got a call, and the first thing he does was he goes to the airport and he looks for a passenger list, and of course, his brother's on the passenger list. He got the job of ringing my mother. He just said, what I did was, I put my head and my arms on the desk, and I sobbed for five minutes. And then I got up, and I dealt with it. He told me on that first week, he said, the only theory we have is that a bit of metal fell in the plane and broke the connection to the tail. And he said, it could have been a bit of metal out of the toilet. We have no idea, he said. Dublin, uh, we regret to inform you that Mr. Vastenavon, not the, the spelling is not good, was travelling in aircraft now believed lost between Roslar and Fishgar today, Sunday, 24th March. Stop. Not yet known if any survivors stop. We'll keep you informed. Air Lingus Dublin. So you see. Because of the lack of hard facts, it was like a void of information. And into that, like all the conspiracies came to life and they grew legs. And there was a lot of finger pointing and there was abuse, there was threats, there was intimidation against my mom and other, other staff members and things like that, which was completely unfair and unfounded. People were blaming the pilot for what happened, blaming the co-pilot for what happened. For my mom, it was excruciatingly tough. I don't know how long after my dad died, she was out for dinner with some friends, she was having a laugh, or for whatever reason, there was an, a moment of levity, and someone came across the restaurant and came up and slapped her on the face and said, how dare you, and your husband responsible for all those deaths. I 
they actually recovered her body. Now that was that then. And it was that beforehand, but again, you were processing it in all sorts of weird ways and, you know, trying to cope. I, I, had, I believe that she just had a bruise on her forehead, um, according to my uncle. Uh, that's all I, I know about that. She was uh, intact. And... Only 14 of the 61 bodies were recovered. Any hope of finding more depended on locating the plane's fuselage. Along with lifeboats from Rosslare and Kilmore Quay, the Royal Navy and RAF were first on the scene, followed by Irish Air Corps Search and Rescue under orders from their commanding officer. I'd say from when I got the phone call at home, we would have made it there within about two to two and a half hours into the search area. Basically, we were put on a search area and we were down in the wrong area at the start. We were blocked out of the Pacific area at Tusker, because the RAF were given that first. It was always a row about that. We were given much farther south, out towards the Salties. From the outset of the search, decisions were made that left unanswered questions. Corkmen Frank Donaldson and Dan Callanan have dedicated eight years to unravelling what they believe is still a mystery. It is hard to believe that once they were told there was something at Tusker and they started finding wreckage and bodies that they didn't concentrate solely on the area around Tusker with every, every bit of resources that they had. We weren't searching the area where the Aer Lingus plane went down. We weren't allowed into the at area initially that day. You just take the instructions you're given. But we were put further south than we should have been, towards the Salties, and there was a splash scene out there, but it was never identified for what it was. Eyewitness accounts suggest that there was another object in the area. People saw what seems to be a different plane. Some saw it crash into the sea, many miles from where the Aer Lingus plane eventually went into the water. Two people saw an object floating in the sea afterwards for about an hour. It was another aircraft, no question about it. The Aer Lingus one went down to Tusker. So it was another aircraft. So there was obviously some sort of near-miss collision that brought the Viscount down. You can't prove it, because you weren't there. For some, the belief that there was a second plane in the skies over Tusker Rock persists to this day. In our view, another plane may have glanced off the port tailplane of the Viscount or may have flown close to the Viscount and the crew of the Viscount may have to have taken evasive action, which perhaps caused structural problems with, with, with the tail of the Viscount. Five witnesses we've interviewed definitively said that they saw a plane uh, between 5 to 12 and 4 minutes past 12 on the day of the crash. That's backed up by four other independent witnesses who claim they saw floating wreckage off the Salties. And that is further backed up by a further witness who said that uh, she saw a smoky spiral heading down into the water off the Salties. And in our opinion, and it's only our opinion, but in our view, those three bits of evidence hang together to, to say that something happened off the Salties on that Sunday. Local trawlermen assisted the search for days and eventually weeks, but always skirting the area around Tusker Rock, where at least two eyewitnesses had seen the plane crash. We were given areas to search. We couldn't go where we wanted to go ourselves. We were told where to go, and that ah, sure it was frustrating. <laughs> day by day, different items were being washed ashore. I remember my cousin going down and finding Paula's, the two-year-old's little coat, which was a small check blue and white coat, I can still see it, with a hood. It was a type of duffel coat, but without the toggly things. 
She was a beautiful little baby, a beautiful child. And I can still see the coat on her. We've worked out of Ross Lair. Uh, we went out every morning and come back every evening, eight till, eight till six. So that was it every day for, I think it was 60 odd days. I'm not, not sure now. It was a problem, I mean, uh, who was funding it, you know, and in actual fact, I mean, most people would think uh, that maybe the, uh, you know, the Royal Navy would be just doing it out, but they were charging as well. And uh, I mean, there was quite a bit of uh, scrounging around for money. You got to remember that Charlie Hawley was, was a Minister for Finance, so he was, in fact, the financial controller of Aer Lingus. Brian Lenhin wrote to him asking for some money for Billy Bates to go out and look for the, for the, for the plane. This was after 11 weeks of both the British and the Irish Navy not being able to find it. Billy Bates, the local man, said he knew where it was. He eventually got the 500 and Billy Bates went out in his trawler. Well, I went out to the office and asked where we were going to search and I was told, go hurry like. And I said, does that mean we can go find the plane? And I said, well, go where you like. <laughs> so we went out in the morning, and the first tow, we were about half an hour, we had found the plane. Because I, one of the men that saw her crashing was fishing with me, and he knew where she was. They had a good idea, so we were looking. We found her the very first trawl. It was found uh, 1.47 miles east northeast of the Tusker, right just about there, right in, in close to the Tusker Rock. And you found that the very first time you trolled there? Yeah, very first trawl, yeah. The Royal Navy had been there, though, of course, before, hadn't they, with their...? Well, uh, they had been there, yeah. They were supposed to have done a, a thorough search at the area three times. Once the wreckage was located, a salvage operation began, led by HMS Reclaim, which was hired from the Royal Navy by the Irish government. There was weeks went by when the divers were going down and they were getting bits and pieces of information. The divers had seen the two pilots in the cockpit, the white shirts, and they, they hoped to have it up the next day. And they pulled up the plane and uh, the ropes broke and it went down again. And uh, they never brought brought it up or uh, the weather turned bad and they gave up. Not good. It gets a bit hazy as to exactly what happened. We know for a fact they lifted it and it broke in two. But when it broke in two, everything and all the evidence that would have been simply fell down into a very mountainous terrain. 47 bodies were never recovered. He's here, look. This is Neil, Neil McCormick. McCarthy's were from Baltimore. Dr. Noel McCarthy was from Cork City. Cork Mayor was a doctor from Switzerland. Edward Hegarty was priest in Ballyfehan in Cork. Paula Gallivan was an infant child. Uh, Marion Gallivan and uh, they were from Cork. Gallans were from Finland or Sweden. Uh, Edmund Favour was a fisherman from Brussels. I would like for everyone to understand after 54 years, not uh, the mechanical side but the the emotional side of the whole event, you know, which is very, very important, I think. One of my schoolmates, uh, his father was working in the Department of Transport as an aviation examiner and uh, he said, do you want to come to a place called Baldonnel? Uh, the wreckage of the aircraft has been found. And uh, in about July of 1968, we came out here and had a look and came into this very hangar. 
and on the ground was laid out the, the, the wreckage, what they had found of the Viscount aircraft that had crashed uh, on, on the way to London. There were hopes that what remained of Flight 712 might reveal what had actually happened in the skies over Tusker Rock. I, I think the percentage was less than 50% of the aircraft found. Not unusual if an aircraft has been seriously damaged and, and disintegrates as it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. At the time, they did the best they could, and, and the wreckage, as I say, was brought here. It was very wise to bring it back here and attempt to reassemble it, and they did a creditable job there, I think, and they could at least rule out, you know, one, two, or three things that went wrong. But the component parts that were missing only added to the mystery, I think. You need to go into great detail and find out as much as you can. You owe it, first of all, to the, you know, the people who died in the accident and then to the rest of the public that recommendations and findings are valid and that it cannot happen again. That's the whole idea behind air accident investigation. But I understand that a man I knew, a man I believe to be a gentleman and, and very good at his job, he had signed the Certificate of Airworthiness of this particular aircraft, the St. Philem, and yet he was the chief investigator through his uh, post in the Department of uh, Transport and Power, he investigated the accident itself. Now, that's an absolute conflict of interest, regardless of anybody involved. The official 1970 report concluded that the crash was caused by impairment of controllability of the aircraft due to damage to its tailplane. There was not enough evidence to say what caused that damage, but the report did not rule out the possible presence of another aircraft or airborne object. The report failed to mention two accidents the previous year involving Aer Lingus Viscount planes. I mean, Aer Lingus itself had uh, three airplanes, three crashes with Viscounts. There was another one that uh, crashed in uh, Bristol. One had actually had a fatal accident in 1967, the year before. This was a training flight over Ashbourne and County Meath. A training captain had been up with two cadets and uh, without any warning, the aircraft had impacted the ground at high speed. I'd like to have seen a review of the, of the accident in Ashbourne, but because only three crew members died, it, it was very quickly forgotten from that point of view. They lost three Viscounts that year. The whole fleet should have been grounded in June 1967. I read the report, the small report that came out two years after the crash, and all these people are dead. This is a totally inadequate reply. Maybe birds flew into the engine, maybe they didn't. Maybe the British was sending missiles up and blowing us apart, maybe they weren't. I thought, this is trite nonsense. It mentioned the fact that it might have been hit by a drone or some other plane, but it didn't seem very likely. Well, the 1970 report was a joke. What I found most shocking was that the chieftains of my tribe really didn't give a shit, you know. That, that's the way I took it on. Right or wrong, that's what I took on. Because I was watching my mother with this, it was a tiny little report, it was skinnier than that, you know, and, and it was just full of technical junk. 61 people fell out of the sky, and nobody seems to care. The fact that there was no clothes here, and it just went on, drips and drabs of information for years to come, made it worse. Over the years, we've realized so many of the family have had these dreams where it wasn't really true. And you know, we didn't have a body, so it wasn't true, you see. So you could dream that it wasn't true, and there were variations, there were excuses about where he was. He'd lost his memory, or he just found some reason that was terribly important that he couldn't come home. And all those dreams, and people had them right through their lives. There was always, uh, yeah, always uh, a doubt that, uh, that he was probably not, not dead and maybe one day he would be at the door. We were in the street and my mother, she said, oh, I see someone like your father, you know, from the back. 
looks like your father, and then she ran and she had a look, and no, fortunately, it's not him. I can still remember one of my friends, I started to cry six months later. Oh, she said, I thought you were over it by now. I mean, in 60 years after it, I don't think I'll be over it. There was no remains for a proper funeral. My dad went to work and never came home. The official 1970 report into the crash of Aer Lingus Flight 712 left many unanswered questions. There wasn't even a May Day distress call. The theories would appear again on the paper or someone would comment on them. And it was tough because in your heart and soul, you don't want these theories to be true as of missiles or a bomb or another plane strike or something like that. You didn't want any of that to be true. You wanted it to be a, an accident, an unfortunate accident. No one's at blame. There's no malice in it. And yes, people lost their lives and a lot of families are affected. But that was tough. Every time those theories grew legs, it was tough. One persistent theory was the presence of a second red plane at the time of the crash. It's our strong opinion after eight years of research that a red plane crashed into the water uh, south to southwest of the Salties on the Sunday of the, of the crash. An unusual plane, the Jindavik, it has no pilot and it tries to be shot at, being a practice target for homing missiles. The drone that was being used, we think, is a Jindavik. This drone looked like an airplane, flew like an airplane. It was colored red. Our suspicion would be that it came uh, out of Wales. At the time, the only place known to fly drones was the RAF test site up in Landbar. Under construction at Landbedra are some more Jindaviks replacing others shot down. Every aircraft sends out heat waves, for example, among the evidence of its whereabouts. Following such waves to their source, the missile can't fail to connect. We've come to the conclusion that there was an unmanned pilotless aircraft stroke missile in the sky at the same time as the Viscount. It's flying a very, very erratic path uh, from about 1,700 feet, uh, seen by 50 witnesses allegedly at 200 feet before, in our opinion, crashing into the Salties here. In flight, if you're flying roughly at 240 knots per hour and you have to make a sudden maneuver like avoiding something, it certainly could damage the tailplane of your, of your aircraft. So it's either a graze or a, or a glance of something that took it out of the sky, or it avoided something by just making a very violent maneuver. Testing missiles is a dangerous business, and Aberport's exclusion zone, shown in red, stretches to within a few minutes flying time of the Irish coast. Could the Viscount's path have been crossed by a stray missile, or more probably an unpiloted target aircraft? The Ministry of Defence says the Welsh missile range was closed that day. There were also several Royal Navy ships in the area. But the Ministry did confirm that part of a pilotless aircraft used as a target was found by a trawler off Wexford five years later. The aircraft would be flying over a danger area that's normally in use, you know, five days a week by the British forces, be they the Royal Navy or Royal Air Force or British Army, whoever like that. And it's a safe uh, thing to avoid it. On a Sunday, it's not active because there's a thing called a no time, a notice to airmen and airwomen, which is put out saying they can go direct. And London said, go direct, there's nothing out there. So I'm quite happy to accept. Uh, at the weekend, is not the time when they do it. The airspace is open to all, so it's closed as a danger area. I'd be extremely surprised if missiles or drones were fired at the weekend. It's just not normal in that regard. Flight 712 crashed because of catastrophic damage to its tailplane. But what remained in doubt for decades was what caused that damage. Perhaps a collision or near miss with another airborne object, or a structural fault or fatigue in a 10-year-old plane, or maybe a maintenance error or oversight. Ultimately, it took the lives of 61 people. We never really had a long conversation about her. When we did, at the 30th anniversary, we began to talk. That's how long it took. Yeah. That's but not we amazing, each had a totally different aspect of what happened at the time, mm. which was extraordinary. Like 
I remember close to the 30 year reunion and the families in Cork had got together and they were pushing for some sort of an answer. If there's a reason that this plane crashed and my relatives are dead, maybe we should know a bit more. The 30th anniversary happened in Cork. Um, it was a great opportunity for us as relatives to meet. And then out of that came the idea of, well, let's form a committee and see what we can do. Um, we got a bit of publicity on the newspapers about our group being formed and on radio and, and that. It was a result of which we were contacted by the British ambassador in Ireland because she too had noted and read the report and seen that uh, there was this constant missile coming from Wales blowing the plane out of the sky story. And she wanted to know if that was true. She was curious as well. And she said she would really, really like to know what was going on. And of course, when you've got somebody with the, you know, aura of the British ambassador on side, suddenly wings started flapping around the place. So shortly after that, Mary O'Rourke, who was minister at the time, she got in touch with us. She said she would go to the Air Accident Investigation Unit. She said she would ask them to trawl through the records and have a look once again. What they had discovered was that the records in relation to the maintenance and servicing of the plane um, were missing, had been missing since the day of the crash. So that was huge. That was massive. Uh, they said papers were missing and nobody was made accountable. And uh, th th these papers were relating to the condition of the flight. A review ordered by the minister into the 1970 report found there were many matters for concern, but no evidence that the missing maintenance records had any bearing on the cause of the accident. The investigators criticise Aer Lingus maintenance scheduling at the time and say the initial 1970 report was deficient. I'm making it very clear uh, in this report, we've made it abundantly clear that it is inexplicable and incomprehensive that that information was not uh, put into the 1970 report. Who should have included that? The person who wrote the report, clearly. The results of the third investigation into the crash of the St. Phelan in March 1968 were outlined this afternoon. The three international investigators said the crash was probably due to metal fatigue affecting the horizontal tail of the aircraft. But the involvement of missiles or other aircraft has been ruled out. We, we're absolutely confident there was no missile or any other aircraft involved. But I think the biggest relief came to the fact that they got rid of a lot of the theories. That was my biggest relief, because that stopped the perpetual cycle of these theories that used to come up at the time. So that was kind of shutting down where the, the theories were growing was important to me, and that's what I, we got in the end. The 2002 report did single out the pilot and the first officer, who, for more than 30 minutes, had attempted to control and safely ditch the plane. They said the pilots would have had to fight every inch of the way and um, they had to pull out manually rather than uh, being held by engines and that it was physically a fantastic achievement. People would say, your dad was very brave trying to land that plane and I've often thought I didn't need to know how brave he was, he was always brave, he was just doing what he did, doing what he loved doing. The first time I was out at the Tosca Rock was for the 50th anniversary. This trip, the 50 years, was just really the power of that. Ceremonies have taken place to mark the 50th anniversary of the Tusker Rock air disaster. 61 people died in the crash off the coast of County Wexford in 1968. They've gone to the trouble of bringing this ship, this massive ship, and we're all on it, and somebody has taken the trouble to recognise 
the grief and they bring you out to the spot where the plane hit the water and that's obviously very moving but you're with everybody else who's standing there and you're watching them. It was a really powerful experience. Altogether, just 14 bodies were recovered. And five decades on, mystery surrounding the crash remains. But so too do the memories of lives lost. Just being there, the memory of it, just it absolutely soothed me hugely. And I'll be forever grateful for that. We were on the boat, we went out in the Elliot, out to the spot, and we were a stone's throw from Tusker Rock. You'd think, you know, if, the, if there was any chance at all, you'd swim there. She's there all the time. She's there, not in a sort of like a fairy or a, an angel or something like that. Perhaps an angel. One of the daughters of the six fishermen who were, mm. who were killed, I met her. And uh, she said that was the first time anybody had ever made any contact with them. I cannot say that I enjoy it because it's a little bit strange, but, but uh, for me, no, it's, uh, it's something certainly that I will never forget. Uh, it's an important uh, event in my life, yes. I realized that that was at that time really a catastrophe. Well, it was a catastrophe for my mother, but wow, did you see a, a region affected by the crash? On the moment when it was 50 years, they started hooting all their horns and... And it was like this most beautiful hand came down and smoothed out the last of the pain. We were surprised, uh, my mother and myself, that he, he actually made the plane. He was the last to get on board. the coordinates do you yeah. by heart yeah it's right on the needles now yeah isn't that amazing god much unbelievable well it's the exact spot where the, the viscount hit the water you know all those years ago i've never been here no i've flown over it a few times you know and i often sort of asked myself you know what was this really like? We, we don't want to forget. Uh, we want to remember, but we have to um, we have to move along. I was very glad to be there. It was amazing. I was thinking, well, I just count now up to sixty-one. So I counted one, two, three, up to sixty-one. And that was my way of thinking about the 61 people who were on board. Aside from tonight's documentary, you can see more about the Tusker tragedy at rte.ie forward slash archives. Next tonight, how can we help heal the health service? David McCullough is standing by now with more details about tonight's edition of Monday Night Live.